Hey everybody. Thanks for joining me. It's really uh, alive in a very unique way in this garden. The people who designed the garden made little modules to represent uh, the flora of different places around the globe, countries, continents. And it's a strange experiment. <laughs> um, but a beautiful one. <laughs> In a way, the plants here are in cages of a kind, because of course the humans tend them. <laughs> it's actually the wrong word. They don't exactly, well, they partly tend them. Um, but they they constrain the organisms they shape how they're allowed to grow or not grow they trim them they dig them up and compost them they cut them down for all different reasons in all different times. And although, you know, there are bees here, some still, uh, most of the natural symbionts for the species that aren't native here um, are missing. So a lot of the relationships uh, in which these plants developed, with which these plants developed, their, um, their relational envelope or, or space, right? The water of their, the living water of their relationships, in in the places they come from, is missing. Um, pretty much entirely, right? Their natural pollinators and all of the symbiotic organisms, including bacteria in the soil, so on. So they're sort of in in relational outer space. And the garden's peculiar in all kinds of ways. Uh, you can you can imagine if you plan a garden like this one, um, where you arrange modules of the organisms from different continents. The Dawn Redwoods. Well, this, this family of redwoods has suffered because a large tree fell and damaged the littlest one very severely. 
and this one pretty badly and took about half of that tree out and this oldest one was mostly unharmed yeah. it's changing golden so you can imagine with me here's a uh, here's one of the signs that'll give you an idea of what i'm talking about Right, so you can see that South Africa's over there, New Zealand, Southeast Asian cloud forest. Let's see, hopefully you can see that. There we go, I think. <laughs> I can't tell what the camera's <laughs> pointing at, because like, if I turn the camera away from my face, I can't see it. <laughs> um, so there's all these little zones, right, and, and they contain uh, representative species, so to speak. Um, well, as the humans think about such things. Uh, and they're all together in a large fenced-in area. In the middle of a, well, not exactly in the middle, at one of the edges of a metropolis. The absolute opposite of this garden, right? If there were an opposite of a living place, it's a city. I mean, outer space is fairly good too. And a city is a kind of outer space. It's a vacuum in a sense, where the domination of structure, machines, humans, behaviors, devices, um, and, and uh, particularly the humans, right, since it, this is <laughs> the whole idea of a city is their idea. The humans decide what will be allowed to live or not in the city, and they start by killing down the context to next to nothing. Um, that's sort of the first move. Oh, this is interesting. Is there a nest here? So, hmm, oh, that's really a lot of scat. So you can see my shadow. Oh, this is actually more complex than it seems. <laughs> you can see my shadow, and there's a bunch of bird scat here. And by the way, this is relevant, <laughs> but this bird scat, there's a lot of it, right? Um, what is this? Okay, well, that's pretty obvious. So looking up, you know, from to where the scat probably came from, I don't easily discern a nest yet. But um, along with, with the birds, you know, bird scat, which there's a lot of it and it's big and white. There's old coyote scat right there. I'm hoping I'm getting this on the camera correctly. And there's more, there's like a trail here, but some of these, mm, nah, this all looks like coyote scat, I think. Yeah. Oh, here's a, uh, a stellar jay. <laughs> Off to cache something. So yeah, this is a really complex thing, and I can see some older scat marks. here <laughs> you know people will wonder um, why is Darren so interested in shit <laughs> but I'm a lot more interested in shit than most of <laughs> what's in the city because 
shit tells stories. And this is relevant because it's possible to learn things in the garden that it is impossible to learn in the city, that, that are impossible to learn. In fact, <laughs> there's a profound polarity, a polarization, right? Um, between the world just outside the fence and the world inside the fence. And some of the things that aren't allowed to exist out there pour into here as if this were a, a little shining light of refuge, right? And opportunity for survival in a context where just about everything else is killed down to near invisibility. Now there are exceptions. Um, but it's so severe that the once pretty much mostly healthy bee population has been experiencing waves and waves of decimation um, for many, many years now. A good 15, <clears throat> anyway, which in bee time might as well be, <laughs> I don't know, a thousand years. A lot of time. Hmm. Now see, here's another interesting thing about shit. So let me see if I can make sure I get this on camera. Now that could be coyote shit. If so, it's some pretty healthy coyote shit. It looks a bit more like dog to me. <laughs> but what I want to make clear about that shit is that it's oriented almost directly north. The animal that left that <laughs> was somehow viscerally sensing, well, is likely to have had a visceral sense of direction and some natural inclination, right, to orient itself. And, not, and, and the animals are extremely oriented in their environments and moments, unlike most of us. And so <laughs> there's all kinds of stories and worlds one can see into by paying very careful attention to actual shit in an actual living place. I don't just learn about the animals and things above my head that I would never know were up there, even if I'm looking. Um, <laughs> I learn things about their relationships and their health, their awareness, their timing, their choice of a place, the place they chose to nest or um, leave scat when they did it, approximately. It's an astonishingly complex source of information. And the more, the more different ways I'm interested in it, 
um, the more profound the experiences and sensings and relationships that will result from me paying attention and why I'm paying attention and how I'm paying attention. Because I'm not merely paying attention clinically. I'm paying attention in a way that is reverent, <laughs> if I might. Hello. Wow. Oh. Hi. Uh-oh, something's going on here. Hi. Yeah. Hi. I'm tempted to go on a long dissertation, but I had another path in mind, so perhaps I'll return. Signs of life, signs of change. They help us, they help me understand not what it is to be human, But what, by being human, is possible? A direction beyond my ordinary, familiar humanity. And when I'm paying attention to scat, where and when it appears, what's in it, its orientation, its shape, of course, I didn't have to dissect it to pay attention to what's in it. Though I might do that under some circumstances. I'm not just there clinically, though. My clinical intelligence is very sharp, right? But that's not what's leading me. Um, what's leading me is something very difficult to describe, but a deep, passionate curiosity to become engaged and involved and to participate in the language of living beings, which is not a language, it's relationships. But there are sort of recognizable they're not languages, there are signs, yeah? Signs would be closer. But the signs in nature are profoundly rich. They're, they're alive, they're pre-denuded, like in, in the way the garden is in comparison to the city. Um, language is in comparison to the signs in nature. Right? Language is like the city of perspectives, I'll call them, but 
They're mostly little tools that become traps. <laughs> um, out here, you've got something absolutely authentic, right? Uh, trustworthy in the deepest way. Um, and <laughs> infinitely, provocatively, these are like flowers that have that blossom in different dimensions of sensing knowledge understanding participation <laughs> see we don't have a word for what i just said in english and so when i say that it sounds ridiculous but what i mean is if our human minds and intelligences are like the hummingbirds and the bees and they're, they're seeking the nectar of knowledge and relationship and meaningful understanding and participation, With th this is natural to me, I think, at least to many. And the signs in nature, when one is present, not just in thinking or in taking pictures, um, but urgently, passionately, uh, these signs are like an orchard that has a thousand domains of, of different kinds of nectar for, for different aspects of understanding and a, um, an amnesis to remember the self, to remember the self in the, within the world of phenomenon, to remember um, before the self, right? Before the collapse to a specific self, there is something there. I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, and in fact, it's there now. But to get back to my, my point, I want to highlight the polarity between the city and this living place. And I want to highlight that polarity for all cities and all living places. Um, because <laughs> wherever humans make settlements, most things die, with the exception of what I was going to mention earlier, the synanthropes, right? The, uh, the organisms that manage somehow, at usually at great peril, um, to symbiose with our developments, right? And these are old, mostly very old companions to our species. Um, animals like mice, rats, raccoons, skunks, opossums, um, rabbits I'm gonna I won't be able to complete the list but you get the idea um, the corvids right blue jays crows ravens magpies uh, some songbirds sparrows pigeons um, seagulls you can see all of these animals they are used to being around sort of surviving as opportunists in uh as my friend ryan first ever says in, in the urban environment right and i had an experience of this yesterday with a raven so i've got to be careful not to bird walk however because i'm gonna <laughs> have too many too many branches on the tree in my mind So there's this powerful polarity, right? And one of the things that means is that a living place like this one, which is created essentially by humans, this, now this used to be a living place, but of a very different kind. It used to be sand dunes. In fact, this whole area used to be sand dunes. Um,
I'm coming to the Toy River. children have a great time here but even I do this thing is so profoundly reminiscent of how I used to play with water when I was a kid oh, running water what an incredible thing <laughs> so there's a boundary right here's the boundary This is new higher tech fencing to ensure people can't get in over the previously rather decrepit um, cyclone fencing. There's a boundary and you can see that there's actually, right, more than just the fence. There's kind of dead terrain on both sides of the boundary, right, that tree got killed to reinforce the boundary because um, they couldn't install the fence with the tree there. <laughs> so they killed it. Uh, so there's a boundary and then inside here there's something like inner space, right? the interiority of being, the interiority of my, my essence, the interiority of my humanity is easily recognized here in this place and that's why shit matters. <laughs> Signs matter to me, right? And matter is a, is a slight gloss on the old Greek mater um, for mother. M other. It's a really interesting little construct, but I need to stay on topic. <laughs> um, I'm aware of that. I'm well aware of that construct. So in this garden, life is pouring into this garden that's been evicted from all around the garden. Right? And the presence of the essence of life is pouring into this garden. And the animals and plants and insects here are... <laughs> There's so many things I want to say about them. In one sense, they're heroic. Right? Um, they're here embodying the livingness of the world and even from from other countries like New Zealand and Africa and South other continents South America um, very specific places in California or Mexico have representatives here representative species right meaning species that embody the lineages and relationships of their origin places over all of time, but now they are living here. And those are like, how can I say, how can I make this clear? <laughs> so on the one hand, it's like a little United Nations. <laughs> Of, of flora, right? Where they all send representatives and come together. And that's pretty astonishing. It's a very rare kind of thing. Though you find it in botanical gardens and curated 
places that humans have made. It's so profound because if you kill up a bunch of terrain but you leave one little living place in the middle, that living place becomes like a beacon. Right? And Oh, wow, a vole. <laughs> Wasn't expecting a vole all of a sudden. And so, to enter that place is like to enter the body of a being. Right? A being of vast intelligence and an incredible age a being of astonishing diversity and a being of urgency because if there were any place around here where nature is much more likely to speak to a human being like me, this is it. So, and of course by speak I don't mean make face noises, I mean make signs. And it's not like I think of the living place as a person. It's not like that at all. It's, um, sorry. There is no, uh, it's a non-ordinary being in the sense that there is no, that we have neither a category in, in English nor a word that would appropriately inform us about the basic category to which this being belongs. So even though it's entirely ordinary, it's profoundly non-ordinary. Um, in the sense that, again, we don't have categories about that. That's a really interesting situation that I'll leave aside for the moment. Um, So this is a rich environment of relational exchange, of memory, of inner space. And it's impossible to see everything. The environment's infinitely deep. Um, but if I'm in the garden in a way that recognizes some of these things, not so much consciously, but relationally, that enacts them relationally, then the garden and I certainly have a conversation. And all of the creatures in the garden, some of their signs I will see. Right? And some of them I will meet. And some of them we will have an exchange. Uh, a transfer. Right? I may give the Blue Jays peanuts, they may give me knowledge. They will show me things I otherwise cannot see because by caring about them, I become interested in them. And by becoming interested in them, I become curious about them. And if I, if I realize that the Blue Jay isn't an ordinary phenomenon at all in terms of human knowledge and language, that it's wildly outside the entire scope of human knowledge and language because it's a living being, then I have very good reason to be interested in the Blue Jay. It will show me where I can't see, where I haven't seen, where I've been blinded, where the cage overcame my passion and inspiration and wonder and awe and love, right? where the words killed off the experience. The Blue Jay will show me many things, but also it's not merely utilitarian. To have a Blue Jay companion is to have new wings 
inside my heart, right? And to have the companion, we don't have to be together all the time, we can visit. Um, now, it's not as easy for me to be directly engaged with, for example, the coyotes. Um, but they send signals all the time in SCAT. And so too the raptors, owls and uh, hawks, kestrels. Polarity. Hmm. Now, you know, it's not only in living places. The signs in the cities, too, of living beings are very important and are part of the language and are a special part of the language. Um, but if you want to better understand or read the signs of living beings in cities, you'll be profoundly aided by, um, you know, going to a place where the signs are profuse, though at first it's confusing and hard to p determine what exactly to pay attention to unless you already have a map of some kind. This is a uh, Really amazing. There's a few really old, amazing stumps here, and this is one of them. And there's some fungus growing on it, even in the cracks. It's beautiful. I once saw a raptor had made a kill, and this whole stump was just covered in feathers. <laughs> and this is one of the paths that the coyotes trod at night. And so, you know, the Parks Department has become very concerned about the fact that there are coyotes here. There were a few, now there's more, now there's open dens and there have been some encounters and such. So the, the Parks Department has put up this game cam. And it's pretty obvious. It says uh, SFRPD on the top, right? It's pretty obvious they intend to do something to the coyotes. And it's very difficult to, for me to imagine that it will be good. And evicting wildlife. And they probably don't do much about dens out in the park, unless there's some kind of serious problem, but the dens in the garden present a peculiar conflict, and the conflict is common, and it's between the curation, you know, the people who uh, structure the garden and their purposes, and a lot of them aren't very good. <laughs> um, but some of them are amazing. And um, living beings that try to take refuge here, um, which is certainly... <laughs> the absolutely natural thing to do, right? Like, if you're an animal, uh, you pr almost certainly prefer to be in here than you would to be out there on the other side of the barrier. And in fact, as an animal, I would vastly prefer to be in here than out there, which is part of why I'm in here now. Oh, hmm. Got some spiny hairs, but I don't think it's uh, likely to be dangerous. Let's see. I just want to get it off of the path. I could guard it for a while, I suppose. I wonder if it will crawl onto a leaf. Yes, it will. 
That will let me safely transport it to somewhere better than the path. There. Now, of course, I can't be sure that that actually helped the creature. <laughs> But at least if it's if it's on the road, right? And there's people around, which there are. Um, probably better not to be on the road. I think it's relatively well defended from predators. <clears throat> Most of them anyway. So this living place is like a fountain for me, right? And I can't say all of the different kinds of water that are here, but I can say that when I listen, care, and pay attention, and if I'm willing particularly, I mean, here's a peculiar thing, I speak to my people, right, the humans, some humans at least, possible humans, imagined humans when I'm making a video, <laughs> imagined future humans, um, with respect and care and awe about the garden. So in a way, I am in, I am in the between, right, of the garden and the humans, and of the living places and the humans and of the animals and the humans, to some degree, um, because I speak for them and, and am for them in my, in my heart, in my thought. <laughs> and not because of a belief, right? It's not a belief. <laughs> no, it's... Um, it's intimacy. Uh, kissing has nothing to do with a belief. If, you, if, if, you, if you're kissing with someone and you, and you both are in, and in it, right? Like, it's a whole new dimension of being and a being, this intimacy. And all other things for a moment fade away because the wonder of the kiss is magical and perhaps infinitely deep. <laughs> um, and that's how it is in the garden, it's intimacy. Yeah. And out there, beyond the old fence, even all throughout the park are roads, and you can see all the cars parked. Right? So the park is a refuge, but it's still inside a city. And that, one way to think about that is that it supercharges the signaling environment of any living, like any place that's allowed to be alive nearby. And, and weirdly, some of those places, more in the past than today, used to be backyards. Right? What we call backyards. <laughs> A little fenced off, you know. There's a there's like a cell structure, right? Imagine a city block. And imagine the city block's first surrounded by automobiles, which all of them here are. And then there's cement. Well by well actually they're surrounded by asphalt, then automobiles, um, then cement, then houses, then and with some fences, and then in the center of that structure, right? In the center, there's these little squares of living places right? um, for some you know in some of them anyway that we call backyards and it's kind of like a cell surrounded by viruses <laughs> there's all this weird deadly structure and then in the very center there's a little bit of life is sometimes allowed But those two become supercharged signaling environments because you don't get the signals where the living beings don't go, where the living beings aren't. Um, at least 
if you get them, let's say they're vastly subtler, right, in general. Whereas in a living place, the signs stand out. <clears throat> the environment is much richer and much more diverse. Insects, plants, animals, weather, humans. <clears throat> Mixing it up. <laughs> And this is why, for me, there's something better than a book. There's something meta to books um, that has the quality of being alive. Yeah? There's something better than books, and it's more than merely alive. And it's more than merely alive in living beings and their relationships. In fact, if you want to put something at the tree of categories, you don't necessarily have to get the exact correct thing. What you want is something that's really good and better than most of the other stuff you've got, or maybe all of it. And if you want to put, like, at the roots of identity, <laughs> if you want to put one idea, one of the reasonably good choices is relationships. What's actually going on? What's going on? Relationships are going on. Right. And those things are unimaginable. They're infinitely complex, even the smallest ones. Take the relationships in... Let's say, funny you can't see my facial expressions. Take the relationships in, you know, <laughs> uh, 10 seconds of the life of a cell, right? <laughs> You'll never encompass them. There might be more information there than humans have ever processed. Um, <clears throat> because weirdly, and this is the weird thing with identity, and this is part of what I'm trying to say about the living place inside the city. Oops. Um, uh, little foot slip. Everything outside of us has infinite relationships. Everything has infinite relationships. There's nothing that doesn't. In fact, there's probably layered infinities of different kinds um, of relationships that actually sort of appear over some span of time, what we refer to as time as, you know, Darren or that, that hummingbird or this tree. Uh -huh. And it's the same inside us and outside us. There's like different kinds of infinities. There's the interior infinities and what we can think of as the exterior infi infinities, but we really don't know much about the relationships between those two things, even though they're bounded by my, you know, by the envelope of my body and such. That's not the end of them, however. I'm chasing a thread that's evasive here. Have patience with me. Relationships. 
so what I was saying is <clears throat> without even in, in physics what we actually we, we, I don't think we can talk about any one thing by itself unless it's related to something else so it's not just that things and beings and processes and so on can be understood as you know relational networks <clears throat> It's that we use relationships. <laughs> relationships are what we see with, is one way of saying it. Right? Um, inside the garden, outside the garden. Hmm. So it's not a bad candidate for the top of the you know, as a toy for the top of the tree of what is everything. Right? It's relationships. And that's a very general, simple term. It doesn't convey anything too particular. It just lets us know that um, all of our experience depends on relative... on the space between us and all other phenomena. Oh, that's what, that's what I was chasing. Okay. <laughs> so, there's a concept that's used in some branches of science, perhaps chemistry, and um, even though this isn't the actual definition of it, I'm going to give a gloss that a molecular biologist I know once uh, presented to me. And he said something resembling it's impossible to know the state of the molecule. What you can know is half the state. You can know the state of the molecule locally to itself, but since the other half exists in relational space, and that space is probably layered infinities deep, um, you will never know the molecule, right? You've only got, you've got the part of the molecule, the molecule that you can touch with your way of looking, and you've got what added to that, whatever you can discern about relationships in the environment, but that's going to be very minute. And so this idea changes what it means to be a thing, right? And that's a root class in our languages, thingness, a very important root class that we often misuse. So any changes to that are very radical. They will change all the other features of our lexicon. It's such, a, it's such a rude idea that if that, if what we mean by thing changes, it changes everything, right? Everything. Um, and the way it changes it is, is to assert that the local phenomenon you see while it is itself layered infinities inwardly, most, one way of looking at it is that, that most of the local thing is, is the, the sort of ambassador, if you will, of its relationships, right? And if you think deeply about this, you'll probably find few situations in which this is not so, including unexpected things like forks and sentences and really, you know, all the way down. It's not the only perspective. I'm not, you know, we don't want to collapse the, the frame. Something got into me. <laughs> that was a really frightening experience. So that was just an absolutely natural moment of pure reaction, <laughs> right? A bee got trapped in the mask and maybe even saw it, I don't know. And the mask amplified the buzzing sound in my ear, right? So I was like, out of there. It could have been a fly, actually, I don't know. So let's just ask a question about something ridiculous, these pots. Are these pots more the objects in front of me? Or is more of their actual nature in all the processes 
required to produce and transport and get them here and you know form them from what we call resources. <laughs> so where is most of the pot? Is it in the pot or the relationships? Right? And the answer of course is both in different ways, important ways. But our idea of thing mostly excludes the relational body of thingness. And it's really easy to do that with objects. It's a lot easier with objects. But it's much more difficult with living beings because we are living beings too. And there's something in us that recognizes when we're chopping up the living beings or obliterating them or making cities or whatever, that we're defecting from essential necessities of our organismal and animalian and human natures and relationships and lineages of ancestral relationships and on and on and on. So the phenomenon of the scat is, is a presentation body, right? for a vast field of relationships. And that makes it an incredibly interesting sign to me. I, I pay attention very closely to this. And perhaps not as closely as I'd like to, but closely nonetheless. It's quiet here for a moment. Outside the barrier here, there's all kinds of noise. I mean, new kinds of noise every day. <laughs> um, in new dimensions, right? We've got electromagnetic noise, we have sonic noise, we have um, luminal noise, we have light noise, of all different new kinds, some of which are hor horrible. Uh, there's unimaginable chemical noise, the body, becomes absolutely disoriented in, its in, in the chemistries that we present it with in cities. Um, because the body is, you know, at this scale, a human, but at the microscopic sca scale, it's a, it's a cellular hyperstructure, and it's a marriage of many, many, well, maybe a few fundamental cell types um, or microorganism types there's viruses, bacteria, animal cells, and perhaps stuff we don't know about, because I'm not sure our catalog's complete by any stretch of the imagination, or even that we cut the catalog in the right places, um, or in good places. You know, can we make better cuts is actually what I'm saying, and I'm sure we can. Uh, categories are a very troubling... <laughs> aspect uh, of the inheritance that we get because <laughs> where those categories are hey unfortunately we inherit the errors of our forebears when we inherit their category set. The, um, their confusions and their omissions and their intentional exclusions come along with uh, the way they've set up categories in language and thought and concept. Right? So we can't throw those away. Um, that wouldn't be the right move. But we can preserve uh, the awareness that the categories are, you know, broken, damaged, um, come with dangerous, sort of sometimes malware included. Um, they might incline us to think about organisms, relationships, situations, phenomenon in ways 
that would be more crippling than they are helpful if we're not aware of that. If we're aware of that, we can use the categories we've inherited where they're useful, we can see beyond them together. <laughs> yeah, that sounds real to me. <laughs> yeah, we can see beyond them together. Um, we can learn where they're broken. He can make those calls with his mouth full. That's an interesting thing that I find somewhat surprising. Um, we, can, we can actually add categories and um, correct or grow like features of the categories we inherit um, so that they're no longer so uh, blinding, crippling, where they are, right? Where they aren't, we can use them. So we can keep one wing in the sort of common human uh, stuff and one wing beyond it, right? And that wing beyond is very important. You don't want to collapse down into any system of knowledge or um, description of meaning or identity or relation. Now here's some kind of old scat that contains berry seeds or fruit seeds. And that's from an event about three weeks ago now, in which all the coyote scat was like this. And that told me they were eating specific fruit. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but it might have been crab apples. Something in the garden. No, not crab apples. Well, possibly. In any case, the thing before us can be understood, very usefully understood, as the in situ, right? The in this moment presence of vast arrays and layers of relationships. So again, if we want to ask, you know, what's going on, fundamentally, relationships aren't only what's going on, they're what we tell what's going on with. They're both, right? So it's a pretty good candidate. There might be a better one. By all means, suggest one, right? But this one, very important, and leads to insights that are otherwise unavailable. Because right? if, if you sort of, if you got the right root idea, then the branches of the tree are going to, well, not the right root idea. If you have a, a very good root idea, right, a very useful um, and one that returns liberties to you that are otherwise lost, uh, then all the other branches of the tree inherit this quality. Right? But if you start out with a root idea of what, say, a thing is or what a being is that is either mostly broken or um, very, in, you know, constricting, <clears throat> very narrow, then the same thing happens. All of the branches beyond it are fucked, right? They inherit that problem. So in a way, the garden is like the presentation body, the local presentation body of the history of life on earth. Oh, this, this Jay has decided that peanuts are good. That's not terribly surprising. But I think he also 
realizing that peanuts are good, right? He doesn't stop there. He becomes interested in the source of peanuts. And I become interested in him or her, though this guy really looks like a male. And he's kind of showing, like, he's making quite a display, right? He's flying right toward my eyes and then veering at the last moment. I wonder if he's bold enough to take one from my hand. He becomes interested in me in the sense of learning about me because if I am the source of peanuts, <laughs> which is of course isn't my only role, um, he needs to be able to recognize me and to understand what led us here. How did we come together, right? To understand histories, to conceive of futures. Yes, Corvids conceive of futures. Um, they can imagine things. Not in precisely the same way we do, <clears throat> but it's very clear they can imagine things. And one of the things they can imagine is futures, and one of the places where their imagination is very active is relationships, <laughs> right? Um, because, as I said, right, it's both what's going on and what we use to tell what's going on. So, want to be on the right channel? <laughs> We're a very good one. Relationships is the right one. It's deep. Um, it's rich. It's alike with reality, right? Everything in physics is relationships. I'm not dismissing physics trivially with that. I'm saying, you know, what we know in physics is probably less than, you know, how much do we know about what's actually going on? Nearly nothing. Um, whenever we acquire knowledge, it immediately seems sort of conclusive and it, it gets projected universally. We project it universally, actually. But um, all of the sums, the sum of the, the, the knowledge that humans have ever had, uh, if we encoded it all, well, now let's see, that won't work because there's different kinds of knowledge. But the sum of the formal encoded knowledge is trivial compared to what's going on, very trivial. And that means that most of identity or meaning or relation is mysterious. It's unknown. It's not ordinary to our language and thinking and conceptual models. And that's very promising because so far our language and thinking and conceptual models are often... <laughs> peculiarly, ironically confused. Um, and this is in part because purpose drives our relations with language and concept and category. <clears throat> and where that purpose is n too narrow or, conf or confused or disoriented in relation, for example. Bingo, we get problems in losses of features of identity, memory, meaning. <laughs> this guy might, maybe, Take a peanut from my hand. 
can't. <laughs> There's a pair, a male and female. The male is very, is vastly more intrepid than the female. And you can ask me, well, have you sexed them? And you can introduce gender concern and language concern. And this is a topic I'm going to take apart in another, in another uh, video, but I know which one's the male. <laughs> and I spent a couple of years learning to determine, which I have not completed this quest yet, but learning to be able to sex geese by, by visual cues other than mere behavior, like being able to physically tell the difference between a male snow goose and a female snow goose. <clears throat> and it's not the kind of question you can brute force your way through. You actually have to go on a quest. You ask the geese if they will help you. Um, you talk with them in your heart, right? It's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not a clinical. For me, it can't be merely a clinical uh, pursuit. No. And what helped me was meeting an old goose couple, which is a very rare thing in nature. They don't live that long. They generally can't survive, but here at one place, it was safe enough over time for this old couple to survive. There weren't enough threats or predators and there was enough food. And I got to meet them. And at first I was very confused and I just thought, oh, these are poor, these poor geese, they're sick. It took me a long, it took me a while to recognize, no, they're not sick, they're old. <laughs> and it came and it, it, it was as if like it was transmitted into me one day. We're not sick, we're old. Right? I'm not claiming, you know, the geese were in telepathic cahoots with me. I'm claiming something even stranger than that because telepathy isn't interesting enough to describe the way that minds network in nature, the way that, the way that relationships form these multi-layered, you know, dimensional hyperstructures of communion, right? Um, and I want a piece of that action. Right? That's why I'm, you know, here. Uh, that's the richest source of intelligence, learning and understanding what is it that humans learned that they didn't learn from nature? So go, you know, if you want water, you go, go to the river, go to the lake, go to the, depending on why you want water, the ocean, go to the sky. Variety gives depth, right? The variety, here's the girl. Pretty sure this is the girl. She's not quite as bold. Yeah, her spirit is different. She's softer gentler, a little more timid, daring in her own unique ways, but she's not like the boy. The boy's like ready to jump. Hello. Oh, beautiful.
that's the first time the girl took one. I'm pretty sure that's the girl, isn't it? Have I got it backwards? Maybe I got it backwards. I did have them confused for a moment there. Can't just walk away from my friends, even though I'm making a video. <laughs> but I think I'm gonna have an escort for a bit. <laughs> so maybe I can walk. Maybe we can walk. I can walk and they fly. I sometimes say, um, my footsteps trod the path on earth, but my soul flies tree to tree. <laughs> <clears throat> I had so many things I wanted to talk about. Um, but the garden is by far uh, <laughs> it sort of it, it drew me toward topic of the garden and the living places, particularly the living places in the cities, in our backyards, and in our hearts, right? That's why this is like inner space, because this is much more authentically like what is inside me. Um, a garden where all the places of the world are brought together, yeah? And all the histories and lineages and ancestors of the world are brought together, even if only in ambassadors, right? And uh, one can enter that body with reverence and attend not exactly the language, but the signs of the living place, because they are signs of our own interiority, right? They are, um, they are catalysts for remembering of the before. Oh, the boy just sweeped like right by my hand. That was a good one, buddy. <laughs> I could feel his wings like right next to my fingertips. And they're not, they don't usually see me talking. Um, I'm not usually making videos when they're here. So he's probably, he's probably kind of trying to figure out, you know, why, why am I making face noises? Cause he knows that I'm quiet. <clears throat> and it is the boy that's following me. I wonder if the boy's canny enough to have emulated the girl to fool me into giving him another peanut. I think he might be. <laughs> he knows that I pay particular attention to her because he's more intrepid. So if I don't 
carefully separate the food caches, right? He'll just dominate and get all of them. Or mo he doesn't really do that. He's not mean that way, but he'll get more, a lot more. <clears throat> infinitely rich, infinitely deep, infinitely familiar, and, but yet in a way alien to our common way of being in our minds and thought is every living being and this living place. And these beings are vastly more profound than anything in our language helps us to see. They are like peoples and we are made to be able to communicate with them. But it's also possible for us to get a kind of a plasticky religion about that and do something else. Um. Hmm. It's a bad smell here. It's a chemical smell. oil or something. Oh my god. What has happened here? Okay. This I'm going to have to investigate. You know, I've been very concerned about a coyote and the scat tells me things about the coyotes. But this... Taking a risk here. I'm going to have to be very respectful because. That den was not there yesterday. And that mound of relatively unstable earth. Oh my goodness. Aren't you bold? Are you like Mr. Bravado today? Is that the deal? You want one more peanut? What's happening? Or anything not yeah, there is. Yeah, that den was not there yesterday. And that means the coyote has detected something that made it change its den overnight. And that coyote laid on that, that's the first, I saw, the first time I saw the coyote, it did not look happy and it laid on that, on that pile of dirt for a while. And this is the other side of the pile, but that hole in there is a den. And one of the things about that earth, I think the coyote was laying on the earth because of two things. One, it is soft and the other, it is warm and it needed heat. Um, and the last night was quite cold and that mound while the while it's very sort of crumbly if you can dig a hole in it if it's moist enough that you can dig a hole in it and make a nest in there it's like insulation and it, it it's warm the earth warms it a bit it probably holds some warmth <clears throat> But you see, I know about the dirt pile because I know about the coyote and I visited the dirt pile yesterday. So I know that it changed overnight. I paid attention to the signal a little bit. I'm not perfect, um, but I'm, I'm really in the place. <laughs> to me, deep space is interesting. And if it's possible to, you know, push a button and be on another planet, I'm all down with that. 
<laughs> to some degree. But this place is all the worlds, all of them. They're here. They're represented here by the living beings here. And so if we keep looking far away, far away, as the humans always do, we're going to overlook the most essential things that are actually One way of thinking about them is that the source of our interiority is their gift to us. The gift of their being produces our interiority. The possibility of having that interiority, because certainly without them, whatever we might have would be a terrifying impoverishment indeed. Thankfully, there are still trees and plants and animals here. And I am deeply aware that if I point my finger to the sky, yeah, in any direction, and you follow that path for a thousand light years, you'll probably never encounter these. There might be life in space, but most of space is empty of our kind of life. of biological life, and it's extremely unfriendly to life. Our world's a paradise. Just look at the other planets. <laughs> Who is making this signal? Oh, it's a woodpecker. a pair of woodpeckers. feasting on something inside the tree limb. Time, orientation, location, moon time, sun time, color, consistency, frequency, shape. relationships. Hmm. I miss the frogs in this little pond. And hope against hope they might somehow return. When you go to the body of a living place, there's a visceral silence inside us with which we can listen to its communications. And if we're there with and for it, it will communicate. All the living beings understand relation, and humans are an incredibly unique opportunity for plants and animals and insects to you know, affect the world of humans and, and worlds beyond their own that are nonetheless proximal to their own. <clears throat> A world, the world of the behaviors of the humans is alien and fraught with astonishing peril to most of the living beings. And when there's not peril, there's isolation. Cages, houseplants, <laughs> in a pot, 
<laughs> a microbiome or, you know, imported microbiome. And that polarity, you know, between city and inner world, we need to, we need very much, I think, I need <laughs> for certain. I don't want to be really in the other. I don't want to be in the construct world. I want to be in this world. Um, <clears throat> but I'm old and, you know, need shelter and many reasons why I can't just come live here. But my heart lives here. And something like my shadow lives over there. <laughs> or a kind of a shadow. <clears throat> I didn't mean that in Freudian terms. Hmm. Living places make different kinds of silences and these silences carry communications. Every time I come here, there's an adventure because there's an exchange, there's a conversation. And for me, it renews my soul. It refreshes my spirit. It reminds me of the, the incredible gifts <laughs> that uh, our bodies and lives and relationships the sacrifices and histories that gave birth to them <clears throat> still alive here today with us, as us, in relationships, if we're aware of it. <clears throat> and the depth of the living place stands in stark contrast to the shallowness of the city. Though if you like what the humans do, in general, then perhaps you'll prefer the city. <laughs> still got my escort. We're like our species, a little dream bubble that the, the, the bubbling ocean of life on earth gave birth to as one of its children. And everything on earth knows this. But we are the newer children. We are the vulnerable children. Our machines or a madness in the animal of our species. And I don't know how the living beings and places conceive of us, but they learn physically, right, that in general, our people are very dangerous um, and will kill them or obliterate their homes or their children or their futures, including our own futures, because our, all the futures of the living beings are bound together in a, wo in a woven union. And the humans will dispose of this for the, tri the most trivial or non-existent of reasons or ideas. So, you know, they learn by direct physical encounter of this. It's not like they have to have an idea, though there might be. You know, I suspect, I suspect really, I, be, I sort of believe, I guess I'd say, 
in the networks of the minds of the living beings or the mind-like aspects of the living beings. And I think of them as all together first. And only then can we make cuts in that and say, well, no, these are the animals, these are the plants, these are the microorganisms, these are the humans. <coughs> One of the other topics I was hoping to explore, but it's too late now, I'll mention it nonetheless. Whatever idea has become popular in some specific segment of humanity about whether or not minds connect. Because right? either, it, you know, some people, uh, sort of literally minded, will say one of two things obtains. Either the only way that minds communicate is proximally, right? Unless they send signals across the gap formally, like a telephone call or a text or so, an email or something, a letter, God forbid. Um, so there's, there's either an obvious physical communication or there's no communication there. Those, those people are, are isolated individuals. Or um, so that's sort of a materialist, a local, localized materialist model of mind. And that presumes that the mind is local to the person, which is something I don't presume. <laughs> Though something mind-like, you know, is something about the person is important, <laughs> to put it mildly. Mm. Or, you know, telepathy is possible. And telepathy is a very value-laden word. So what I want to say is what, what we presently, what is commonly known about the ways that minds connect and they form networks, it should be obvious, our networks are abstractions of this. Our television stations are abstractions of this. Our radio stations are abstractions of this. They form networks, right? Living beings form networks and minds, minds are a network phenomenon. They're not a local phenomenon. Don't get a mind unless you belong to a network and are raised in a network and, and embody that network in your mind and so on and so forth. Um, at least not a mind like, you know, we usually think of one. So either there's absolutely no non-ordinary connection between minds or something else. Telepathy, something more than telepathy. Whatever it might be, whatever we commonly know and, and suspect, particularly scientifically, about minds is extremely limited. Um, in minds and how they connect, right? So, you know, there's, there's a lot of noise about science essentially proves that telepathy isn't going on. Uh, no, it didn't. Um, the scope and the focus is confused. There's all kinds of problems with that whole idea, actually, because there are features of things that humans do and are that shy away from testing and, clin and clinicity, right? They won't show up for it, but they're, they're immediately present in intimate contexts, right? And so you, you would have to look for them very carefully there um, rather than do a bunch of clinical things about something that's an aspect of intimacy. <clears throat> Certainly if you're going to share minds, there's intimacy. Yeah. And it's the people that we are intimate with that we have the most experience of something resembling mind sharing or telepathy but what I want to say is what the, the ideas that we have right now, it's as if we've discovered two of the plants on Earth, right? Because what actually goes on with minds is endlessly more sophisticated than anything we, we're capable of imagining or modeling. But we can participate in it. Huh.
That crow just dropped a big branch on the ground. We don't have to know the answer to participate. This is the really fascinating thing. Children and those who are fascinated or in love participate instantaneously, right? They just fall into participation. We adults might have more trouble, might have to cultivate uh, a vehicle, right, to allow us, for, to, for us to allow ourselves to participate deeply in uh, the intimacies of the networks of minds. And they are ecstatically beautiful. And like the living places in their astonishing diversity and transformation over time. 